everybody, and welcome to Real Shame. It's a show where these two fellas, me and this guy, talk about the movies on our list of movie blind spots, movies that we haven't seen that we are trying to get around to seeing. Uh, my name is Andy. I'm Adam. And on today's episode, we're going to go with a sim- pretty newer movie, 15 years old, Hitch, yeah. from 2005. But pump the brakes before we start talking about our Monday movie. We always like to talk about what we've been watching. And before we talk about what we've been watching... Oh, no. I just want to say, not to, not to bring the room down, but uh, I, I, by the time this airs, it will probably have been, I guess, about a month ago. Yeah. But I did want to mention, because we, we actually didn't watch a movie with this lady in it, but we did mention her. Olivia de Havilland uh, turned 104 in July, but then passed away, sadly, a few weeks later. So, I mean, I don't think that's funny. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not chuckling because of that. I, I'm chuckling because of the timing where yeah, we're yeah, like, yeah. hey, Olivia de Havilland's about to turn 104. Sadly, she passed away, but I think it's cool that she and both Kirk Douglas uh, were, ended up being centenarians. Yeah. Of course, they both passed away this year. A guy that we did see in a movie, John Saxon, also passed away around the same time. He was Sador, yep. the bad guy in Battle Beyond the Stars. Yep. And if you've seen... Any decent amount of movies, you've probably seen this guy because he's in A movies, B movies, C movies, F movies, Z movies, everything in between. He was kind of like the Nicolas Cage uh, of his time, but he's in a lot of stuff. And then finally, also didn't see a movie with this guy, but he recently passed away. We had the opportunity to see him when we went to go see The Thing at the Alamo Draft House. Mr. Wilford Brimley was in attendance, and he told some really, really funny stories. I don't know if they're purposefully funny. (laughs) Well, he... he seemed a little off his rocker, but he, it was yeah. awesome to have him. He was there. definitely a little cranky yeah. about E.T. in particular because E.T. and the thing came out the same year. Yeah. But still, it was an entertaining evening. It definitely was. Definitely was. Uh, and, and, of course, Wilford Brimley, he's not only great in The Thing, but he's also great in China Syndrome and Cocoon and Absence of Malice and Remo Williams, anyone? <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to point out because we, we've lost a few of the, the old guard recently, just kind of give them their mention, tip of the hat, and RIP. So now, what have you been watching since the last time we met? So last time we covered two musicals, right? Mm-hmm. We covered um, Singing in the Rain. We covered Umbrellas over Cherbourg. Umbrellas of Cherbourg, yep. yep. Umbrellas of Cherbourg. So um, Kirby and I wanted to keep that musical train a running, and we're not going to sing uh, for this podcast, at least not yet. So we we're watched. Not. <laughs> oh, no, Sorry. no, we're uh, not. no. We watched the the producers. So Kirby likes the producers. Uh, it was my first time watching it. I thought it was okay. I thought it was good. I think it suffers from the same thing that you know I said about musicals last time, where if the songs aren't really that catchy or they're not, you know, I don't enjoy the songs, then it makes the musical kind of hard for me to enjoy. This was the Matthew Broderick Nathan Lane one. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Just check it. Uh, and we watched Chicago, uh, which, you know, I said in that episode, that's my favorite musical, and it, it is still. And that musical is just awesome. It's just a classic. It's really well done, and it's just a lot of fun to see. And in addition to that, oh, were you going to say something? Nope. No. Okay. I thought, thought you sighed for a second. I was like, oh, no. Nope. In addition to that, we watched Mamma Mia and Mamma Mia 2, or Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again. Here we go again. Have you seen the Mamma Mia's? I've seen Mamma Mia, the first one. I don't think yeah. I've seen Here We Go Again. I, I did. I haven't gone again. Oh man! Uh, so the first <laughs> no, <laughs> the first Mamma Mia is very fun. It's just a, it's just, it's a fun movie. It's just there's, it's, it's just a blast. I don't know how else to say it. There's not a lot of story to it, but the music's fun. It's ABBA, right? Mm-hmm. So the music's very catchy and very fun, and it's just fun to see all these actors have fun. The other one, two, not so much fun. Um. So I, I talked a long time ago about this um, YouTube uh, Chrome film critic, film essayist named Patrick H. Willems, mm-hmm. and he did a thing on Mamma Mia 2, which is probably the reason why it incited me. Well, it is the reason why I decided to watch Mamma Mia 2. And he was talking about how it is a better movie than the first one, and he goes through a whole list of things. And, you know, look it up if you're interested so it made me curious to see both Mamma Mia and Mamma Mia 2 to see where I fall in that whole thing. And I think he has some valid points, but I think he leaves off. There, there's ways that Mamma Mia 2 is better than Mamma Mia, and he's, those are valid points it brings up. But at the end of the day, it's just not as fun of a movie. And so I just I don't like it as much as I like the first one. Like the first one doesn't have a whole plot, which is one of his issues, mm-hmm. where the second one does. But to me, the first one's still more fun and more enjoyable to watch than the second one is. It's kind Adam, of a... Adam was living his best life watching I was living my best life. 
All right, I have two things. I'm going to finish up real quick. I feel like I'm taking a while. Uh, the other thing I watched was the Beastie Boys story. So this is kind of like a... Uh, I, I don't know if it's really necessarily a documentary. It's more like a concert film. So I guess what happened is the Beastie Boys came out with a book called the Beastie Boys Book. I think it was like last year or the year before. And then they were doing a theater show where they would have kind of like mixed media, like, and they would, the two um, members that are left in the Beastie Boys would stand up from the audience and kind of talk about different stories that were featured in the book, right? And so the Beastie Boys story is a film version of, of like, I think three nights of them giving that talk in New York. Okay. And I thought it was good and interesting. I don't know a whole lot about the the Beastie Boys, so I thought it was a pretty interesting primer and kind of get an overview of their whole career, you know? But there's some meta-ness that they were talking to the director, Spike Jones about. Mm -hmm. Like, they had a back and forth with him that just kind of didn't really work for me. Um, and the last thing is, uh, also because of Patrick H. Willems, I watched Love and Mercy, which is the uh, a Beach Boys docu- or not documentary, but a uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. biopic. Yes, thank you, Kirby. It's a Beach Boys biopic. Eh, it was not great. I, I I understand he likes it because it kind of takes that formula of a biopic and kind of upends it and does it in a different way, and I can appreciate for that. But I just think on the whole, it really didn't do anything for me. Have you seen Love and Mercy? Yeah, I, I actually like it. Okay. I, I don't think John Cusack looks a single thing like no. Brian Wilson. No, no, not I, at all. Paul Dano doesn't really either, but I think he looks more like him as the young Brian Wilson. But yeah, John Cusack looks nothing like uh, old Brian Wilson. But I like the kind of behind the scenes, like, and I like that it focused, like, I like that it shows more how it, t go, what goes into making an album. Mm -hmm. And I think they benefited a lot from those tapes from behind the scenes of Pet Sounds and that kind of stuff. So I like that aspect of it. But I think on the whole, the movie just really didn't work for me. Yeah. All right, so that's a lot of what I've been watching. What about you? What have you been watching? Before I get into what I've been watching, yeah. uh, I also love Chicago. I think it's great. And it won Best Picture that year, and I was totally on board with that. And the other thing I was going to say about the Mamma Mia movies, this is not my idea. Somebody <laughs> somebody on Reddit said this, so I'm not taking credit for it. It's I, I don't remember the username or anything like that, but I saw that he, he was saying, hey, if they ever make Mamma Mia 3, they have to call it Mamma Mia Take a Chance on 3 oh. instead of Take a Chance on Me. Because that's an Apple song. I so thought was, you were going to say Mama Thria. That, that, that's, that, that's also good. That's also good. And you can take credit for that. How about, how about Mama, Mama Thria take a chance on three? There you go. Yeah, you there just combine go. them both. Yeah. So you have some random Reddit user and your idea. There you go. Two great tastes that taste great together. All right. Uh, so I only watched one musical, but I did mention it when we were talking about Umbrellas of Cherbourg. I watched the follow-up, kind of the follow-up to that called The Young Girls of Rochefort. Also with Catherine Deneuve. And also, I don't know if I mentioned it when we were talking about Umbrellas with Cherbourg. It also has Gene Kelly in it. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah. Uh, he plays the, her older sister. Well, it's her twin sister in the movie. He plays in reality, her older it sister. Was her older sister. He plays her older sister. <laughs> it, was, it was Catherine Deneuve's twin sister in the movie. In reality, in real life, it was her older sister. But he plays the twin sister's love interest. Awesome. Uh, it is more of a traditional musical. They do, you know, sing and dance. They don't sing every single line like they do in Umbrellas with Cherbourg. Uh, honestly, I think I liked it better than Umbrellas of Cherbourg. I think Umbrellas of Cherbourg, like we said when we talked about it, it's a cool movie to see at least once, yeah. just to kind of see the experimental uh, nature of it. But uh, if you enjoy traditional musicals like I do more than that, I think Young Girls of Rochefort would be more up your alley. Switching gears completely, I watched a sort of European horror film from the early 70s called The Blood Spattered Bride. And I think that was influential to Tarantino, like okay. in Kill Bill. Oh, yeah, uh, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. Volume 2, whichever one. Uh, I think he uses that title or something. I, I, I don't know. Uh, these European horror movies are... You have to know what you're getting into when you see them. So, like, Jess Franco wrote, or, uh, directed a lot of vampire movies and they always they were always female vampires and they're always they're always kind of erotic or whatever this is kind of like it's not a jess franco film but it's kind of i don't remember who directed it but it's kind of like that these movies are almost plotless a lot of these kind of european gothic sort of horror they're like art house horror films so they're not scary in the least mm -hmm. they're more uh they, you know they've, they've 
great scenery. They have beautiful men, beautiful women acting in them. So it's not really so much about the story. It's more about the ambiance and the atmosphere. I thought it was it was pretty good on that level. If yeah. you're looking for story, forget it because there's <laughs> there's almost none. Uh, I finished. I, I don't again. Is don't that, remember if I. I was gonna so, sorry. Right. Are those like Dario Argento kind of movies? Would you put that in the, kind of lump the same kind of category? I mean, I think Dario Argento is they're they're similar, but I think the Dario Argento movies definitely have more of a story. Okay, okay. No, no, I mean, not always. I, honestly, there's a lot of Italian horror films in particular that like Demons and Demons Two from the '80s that they're almost nonsensical. You watch it for the gore and, yeah. and, and stuff. So um, I have a big blind spot for the European horror, so I don't know a whole bunch of it, but I do know. Of Dario Gento, so yeah. that's why I was trying to use as a frame of reference. Yeah, and I mean, he he definitely has some some good uh, movies. I actually haven't seen a lot of his movies, but I've seen, I think, probably the really, really heavy hitters like Suspiria and Deep Red and, and stuff like that. Um, I finished the Mission Impossible movies. Can't remember if I mentioned that the last time. So. I think you did. I think you ranked them, and I remember, yeah, you did, you did rank them, and you, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to so, remember more details, but that's all I remember. <laughs> if uh, if I didn't if I didn't rank them or mention them, I guess I can do that in, anytime because I, I know what the order is. We'll throw um, it on the website. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but I decided for my next franchise, I would watch the Jack Ryan movies because these are movies that I have not, other than Shadow Recruit, which is like a prequel or whatever. I've not seen the Jack Ryan movies in ages. I haven't seen Hunt for Red October or Patriot Games or any of that stuff since the time they came out, and I've still not ever seen the Ben Affleck one, the Sum of All Fears. Yep. Yep. And so far, I've only watched the first two. I've only watched Hunt for Red October and Clear and Present Are you Nature. watching them in like r- any certain order? Just the order they were released. Yeah, they released. Really yeah. cool. Um, I, I I don't know if I want to watch Jack Ryan's Shadow Recruit again because I really hated it when I saw it originally. Um, it, Hunt for Red October, it's not quite as good as I remember it, and neither is Patriot Games for that matter. They're both still pretty solid, but yeah. they didn't blow me away like I, they did back when I first saw them. When I was younger, but they're still, you know, they're they're still decent. But I still got to watch Clear and Present Danger and some of All Fears, and then I'll probably watch the Jack Ryan. I I keep wanting to say Jack Reacher, which is the Tom <laughs> Cruise series. That's the next Jack one. Jack Ryan. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen those. There's only two of those. I've, I've seen those. And then finally, I I finally got around to watching Hot Rod oh, with Andy Samberg and the two other guys that are in the Lonely Island, whose names I can't remember. It's they because uh, peculiar names. You really liked. Um, Palm Springs so much, so you just wanted more Andy Samberg. I, I mean, I did. I, I was I was going through Prime because it's on Prime Video. I was going through Prime Video, and I, I was like, oh, there's Hot Rod. I've been meaning to watch that forever. Mm-hmm. I thought it was really funny. Um, I, I I like Pop Star, Never Stop, Never Stopping, but mm-hmm. I think this is a lot better. I think this is kind of a, it's a weird thing to say, but it's kind of like a cuter movie. Like, it's really kind of sweet. Um, it's, it's funny. It's also got, you know, Danny McBride in it, who honestly, I don't care for most of the time, but he's not bad. Sissy Spacek, uh, Ian McShane is his name, that the guy from Deadwood and the John Wick movies and whatever. Um, and Bill Hader wears a shirt just like I have here, (laughs) an animal shin shirt, except his is black, but it's got the right amount of silly humor, the right oh. amount of absurdism. I I, I kind of dug it. I thought it was pretty funny. Have you seen Hot Rod? I can't remember. No, I it just You're I, like, eh. yeah, it just <laughs> never looked interesting to me. I think you know there's eras of comedy, right? And then I think you kind of fall into a certain era of comedy, right? Mm-hmm. So I feel like the Will Ferrell era of comedy, which is like the old school and all those kind of you know wedding crashers and stuff like that, that was post me so i matured out of that okay. and you know i feel like the adam sandberg era comedy you know happened after that and that was way and i was way you know matured outside of that bucket or whatever so it just never lo- his comedies never looked really interesting to me so i never sought him out you know I, d- I did see pop star never stop popping and i i enjoyed it i mean i like you know the musical uh the fact that there was musical music in it and mm-hmm. stuff like that that was done by the Lonely Island is what really kind of pulled me in. But, you know, uh, I've been kind of watching on and off um, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. So I, I'm kind of warming up to Adam Sandberg. But, you know, he was in a later era of SNL and all that kind of stuff. So I never really got into it. Andy, Andy. Sandberg. Yeah, see, and I call him Adam Sandberg. <laughs> 
all the time for such some disrespect reason. Respect for him. You don't even call him by his right name. Yeah. Well, I, I do think you should watch Hot Rod. So the the way well when I watched it, it was later at night. I was looking for a comedy to watch, and it's only like eighty five minutes or okay. something. So it's short. So even if you can't stand it, it's not going to take up much of your time. So I, I recommend it. I thought it was funny, and it has a lot. It, it's not pop star never stopping. It doesn't have them you know singing or anything yeah. like that. But it does have some pretty funny music in it, right. and some pretty funny tributes to some other movies. I thought so. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, but that's what I've been watching. All right. So I'll with the show. with that. Let's talk about our feature review. And our featured review is 2005's Hitch. Some guys naturally develop a comfort with the opposite sex. They like women, women like them. Everything flows naturally. Back in college, I was just not one of them. I seemed to lack the basic understanding that my peers just intuitively grasped. But like any late bloomer, I was eager to make up for lost time. So Hitch came out in 2005. Like I said, it's directed by Andy Tennant and written by Kevin Bish. Is I think how you say his name? That's how I spell it. Sure. That's <laughs> what it looks like to no me. Idea. Hitch, Alex Hitchens, can help you woo the woman of your dreams. He's the date doctor, or, or as he likes to call himself, a consultant. As he helps his client, Albert, played by Kevin James, woo a socialite, Hitch meets and begins dating a gossip colonist, Sarah Mia, Mia, Miles? I can I can never say her last name right. Mia's. Mia's. Miles. I couldn't even remember her yeah. name. All right. Who is interested in Albert and Allegra's relationship? So this is a movie that I've seen a couple times, a handful of times, a movie Andy hasn't seen. So Andy, uh, what did you know about Hitch going into it, and what did you end up thinking about Hitch? I knew it had Will Smith and Kevin James. Kevin James is his name, yeah, right? Yeah, Kevin James. For some reason, I second guess myself. I was thinking of something. And as Ava Mendez as Sarah. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, that's and, and some other people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, but yeah, that's that's about it. I mean, I knew it was a comedy with with Will Smith, uh, but I'm I'm deficient in a lot of Will Smith movies, as we know, so I didn't really know much about it besides that. And now you want to know what I thought of it. <laughs> it's, that's like, uh, it's, no, like, so, it's like it's like it's. <laughs> I, I, well, I said this. This movie was very frustrating to me okay. because I felt like it started off beautifully. I was really hooked from the beginning. I liked him. I like you know the whole. I'm a dating consultant. I'm yeah, a date yeah. doctor. I thought that was cool. I can totally buy Will Smith as that. You know, he's like a tall, handsome. You know, dude, he knows what he's talking yeah. about, whatever. He's suave, he's charismatic, all this stuff. I thought that was cool. He's breaking the fourth wall. He's telling you how he does things. It shows in the very first part of the movie, he's setting up these guys, yeah. you know, to to meet the the ladies of their dreams or whatever. And then he meets Eva Mendez. He meets his, his match, yeah. right? Uh, even though she's not... A, I, I honestly thought she was going to wind up being like a date doctor, like oh, for a female yeah, or yeah. something like that in the movie, and that they were going to, you know, kind of fall in love or whatever, get there, you know... Whatever, but she still is very formidable because she's just kind of a hard nosed reporter, like you said, like yeah. a gossip reporter, or whatever, who's interested in Kevin James and the other lady, uh, Allegra. I, Allegra, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I don't, I that actress, her name is Amber Valletta, I think. I'm like, I, I don't know that I've seen her in anything. Yeah, else. I'm I sure looked, she's in other movies, but I just, yeah, I looked her up on IMDb to see if there's anything big she was in, and I, yeah. I didn't see anything. What lies beneath? It's been Kirby so long, says it's she's been in so what long lies since beneath. I've seen. I mean, it's been like twenty years since I've seen What Lies Beneath, so I, it's been a long time. But, um, but, but yeah, I thought it was really good for about the first hour or so, yeah. and then I remember it really hit the skids, and it really started to drag. And I remember like looking at the time code of the movie at that point, and it was about an hour into it. Do you and know the what? Two hours. Do you know what was happening on screen about that time? I, I think. Uh, was it when he he was like drunk on Benadryl or whatever and he was at her apartment maybe which that he did look funny he looked like an alien or something yeah. with his face all puffed up or whatever um, but I thought it really kind of drug in that second hour yeah. and I also feel like it's two different movies at least I I don't know I, I feel like they should have focused more on Hitch and the Eva Mendes character yeah, whatever her Sarah. name is Sarah uh, and the whole Kevin James thing seemed to be not an afterthought because it makes sense in the movie because he's tr he's trying to help mm -hmm. Kevin James woo this socialite or whatever she is, uh, but 
every time it would go to Kevin James and this girl, I just didn't care at all. I cared way more about the Will Smith, Eva Mendes thing. Um, and, and again, I, I realized those are the same movie and they make sense in the same movie, but I felt like part two, Hitch two should have yeah. been the story of how he helps Kevin James woo this lady. Hitch one could have been about him or yeah. vice versa. Hitch, yeah. Hitch one is about him totally helping. And then Hitch two, now it's time for him to help himself. Um, so I, I was very, very conflicted in that second era. I also felt like it got kind of serious in the second hour, like a little more serious than, than I felt like it should have gotten. Yeah. Um, overall, I actually did like this movie. I feel like it coasts by, I, I feel like it is the charisma of Will Smith I have that right and, in my and Eva Mendez. Cause I think Eva Mendez is great and she's funny yeah. and she's just as good as Will Smith in this movie. I feel like on the strength of those two alone, the movie is worth watching. I just wish that like the second half of it would have been a little better for me. And, and I understand I'm, I'm talking about like, well, this is what I would have done if I would have made the movie or whatever. I'm sure, you know, I mean, it's just a fine movie as it is. Uh, but those were the kind of the things that kind of nitpicked at me, but I, I enjoyed it overall. I just, I really liked that first part of that first hour. And then kind of the second hour, it was like uh, yeah. kind of going down for me. But overall, I would say that that I did like it. That's good. Yeah. I just didn't love it. <laughs> so I had an interesting experience watching it again because normally I like this movie and it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But I guess I was in a weird mood this weekend because <laughs> honestly, like, I think like you, I found it kind of annoying towards the end of it. Yeah. Um, and I was just, and honestly, if we weren't watching it for the podcast, I probably would have turned it off. Yeah. So I don't know where I really feel about it. Cause I don't know if that's indicative of how I'm going to always feel about the movie or if it was just, you know, a mood I was in or whatever on the weekend. But I, I do agree with you. I think a lot of it, I think it, it it's, it's Will Smith that carries this whole movie and yeah. the fact that he is so charismatic and so it's so enjoyable just watching him be there and be all that kind of stuff it is very cool i do want to say i wish we had more nerdy will smith like when it did the flashback yeah. like i want like a i mean maybe we had the fresh prince of bel-air can kind of do that but i do want like i wish of that time we had a more fl movies where he flashed back to being a nerd in college yeah because i think that's very cool um uh of it it's 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 interesting, I guess, a little bit. I'm trying to deal with why it kind of gets slow in the second half a little bit. And I think the big thing is, you know, they're trying to show in the movie that Will Smith was wrong about women in the beginning because he was looking at every relationship from that broken perspective of when he got his heart broken in college. And then Kevin James is, you know, basically ignores whether on purpose or not, the rules he sets up for him to date Allegra Cole and she falls more in love with him. And that's when they find out at the boat, you know, that she, she's like, oh, you told him to do all these things. He's like, no, I told him not to do any of those things. I told him to not do those things. And then that kind of clicks in his head that, oh, maybe I'm wrong about this and maybe we can kind of, um, you know, maybe the way he was trying to pursue a relationship with Sarah, Ava Mendes' character, uh, you know, was wrong. And that's why it was ruining on it was getting ruined on comical proportions and all that kind of stuff yeah i do think like some of the the the, the stuff the middle the middle section the act two is uh, what they call sometimes the trailer moments or the funny parts you know where he you know gets the allergic reaction mm -hmm. you know he takes her to ellis island although the realization that her uh, a grandparent was a murderer. Was it was pretty dark for this kind of movie I, and I, stuff like that. I feel like that should have come up in his research, but yeah. Well, he he said he said he thought he said he saw oh, it was yeah, a butcher, he said, yeah, butcher of but he didn't know it was like a person butcher. But still, if yeah. I read that, I think I would be like, uh, yeah, I don't know. He was basically um, her grandfather was uh, uh, the guy from uh, the Gangs of New York, Bill the Butcher, basically. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, Scorsese. Uh, so I so all that kind of stuff is fun and it's fun seeing Will Smith be charming and so it's fun seeing Will Smith kind of be the butt of the jokes and stuff like that. But yeah, I think overall I just kind of was just apathetic and not really feeling the movie this time around as much as I 
as I could. And there's some things that in there that I was um, picking on a little bit, like the fact that, you know, at the beginning, Ava Mendez's character throws like a, a disposable camera, which I'm like, didn't they have like a digital cameras back then, <laughs> back in 2005? I don't know. I seem to remember I was that probably game. using disposable cameras then, but yeah. I have no idea. And, uh, you know, you get to see the the meme that 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 we uh, that we see on the internet where the Will Smith's like I thought I saw this going differently in my head. Uh, I don't no? think I've seen that meme. <laughs> oh well, it's 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 a meme. <laughs> but ultimately, <laughs> like this movie, like it, it just is just cute and sweet, and um, you know I, I think that it doesn't have a lot going for it in terms of like depth and talking about the 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 you know human problems and all that kind of stuff and getting at the root of what it is to be human. But, you know, not all movies need to do that. And I thought it was kind of fun. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what you're saying. And I think I, I think everything you said was correct or is correct about what they were going for as far as, ah, look, Will Smith is actually not very good at all the stuff yeah. that he tells other people to do. And, and yet Kevin James kind of ignores some of his advice and, and does whatever. But I still felt like... It was also it was not only that maybe but it was also just a combination of bad luck on Will Smith's yeah. part. I mean, when he eats the thing and he has an allergic reaction, it's not like he was doing something wrong yeah. on the date. He just didn't realize he would have an allergy to that. Or when he was getting on the jet ski, he accidentally kicks her in the face. It's an accident. Yeah. It's not like he's unsuave because he did that. And so I feel like the message that they're trying to give you is that oh, he's not as cool as as he as you think he is when he actually goes out on dates himself. I'm like, but it's also a combination of just yeah. unfortunate things that happen. Um, and then the same thing with Kevin James. I feel like Kevin James does follow his advice some, but he's just such a klutz. Yeah. He still gets mustard on his shirt, and he still like almost starts to walk away before he's supposed to kiss yeah. the girl and does his inhaler and t tosses it or whatever and all that stuff. So again, it's it's both. I mean, I th I feel like, but I feel like the director or the writer or whatever is trying to just get you to see it the one way. And I'm like, well, I I think it's more than that. But gotcha. uh, I have nothing against Kevin James. Uh, honestly, <laughs> I ha I don't think I've seen. I've never watched King of Queens. And I don't know that I've seen any of the like Paul Blart stuff or the Zoolander stuff. I know now he's in like a horror movie or something. Was in, I can't. He was in Zoolander. I can't remember. Uh, oh really? Oh, yeah. I haven't seen Zoolander too. Uh, well, he's in, he's playing like a against type. He's playing like a serial killer or something it's, in a new it's movie. It's not Mandy, but the, it's a it woman. Becky? Yeah, Becky. Becky. Yeah, it's Becky. Becky uh, yeah. So I'd be interested to see that. And again, it's not that I dislike him. I just don't know that I've been that exposed to him. But I just didn't find, I don't find most of his stuff funny, mm -hmm. at least in this movie. So again, every time it cuts to him, and like when he's doing like the dancing thing, I realize some people just yak it up during no. that scene. No. I'm just like, let's get on to the next thing. Like, I don't really care about yeah, it. Yeah, and I was thinking about some of the stuff they were doing in that act two or in the act three that was probably making it feel long. And I think like, we didn't need the scene at the Knicks game. I guess that was the basketball team they're at, whatever, yeah, yeah. whatever Watch sports the game they're at. With the mustard stain, like I don't, I think if we saw a newspaper headline that had the mustard on his shirt, that would have been fine. And Allegra Cole saying it on the boat would have been fine. And I think also they spent too much time with the Jeffrey Donovan, Do Donovan's character, which was the the Vance. Vance, yeah, the Vance guy that was trying to use Hitch to just hook up with women and stuff like that. They didn't need that in the movie. Yeah, at all. I think or I, that or the girl. So I think they, Perfect. yeah, I think they could have excised those pieces a little bit, and it would have made that second part tighten up a little bit because i think if all that stuff happened to her friend off camera mm -hmm. you know where she's just like this date doctor guy is doing this i need you to research this and then the whole time we know that will smith's a date doctor and then we can have the scene at the park where they catch him on film i think that would have been fine i don't think we need to see that advanced character and doing stuff to the girl and stuff like that so yeah i totally agree i didn't need any of that i think that's probably in my mind that's probably what added to the bloatness of the you know latter half of the movie. If stuff. this was more of a screwball comedy, I feel like all the connections and this person happens to know this person and this person knows this person yeah. fits a lot more because in a screwball comedy, it's already kind of surreal and wacky and zany yeah. and it's like it's believable that this person happens to have met this person and this person had brushed this person and this person had a near miss with this person. Then they find out their true identity and then, oh, you're that person and whatever. I feel like it works a lot better in much more of like a screwball fashion. And I wouldn't consider this a screwball fashion. It's a rom-com. Yep. So, For sure. And it's too serious uh, in the second half. 
So that's our opinion. Anything you want to add on Hitch? That's all I kind of have. So you for mentioned it. the director Andy Tennant. I looked up his filmography, and he knows his way around Rom-coms. romantic comedies. Yeah, yeah. He's done quite a few, and he's got a new movie out, which I know is at the top of your watch list. It's the secret dare to dream. Oh, is you put it out in the universe, <laughs> and they made it. <laughs> like you said, I did. I did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I saw that. That's his most recent movie. Is that the secret? <laughs> that dare explains to dream. our text conversation so much. Now. Yeah, I, I thought that was funny because I saw a trailer for that yeah. with, with Katie Holmes and Josh yeah. Lucas, and it I'm doesn't... like, oh boy. But oh if boy. you want us to watch the secret dare to dream, you got to leave hey, a comment below. If you leave a comment, we'll watch it, yeah. and I guarantee you, we'll. I bet we'll have a good time. <laughs> we'll have a good time watching it. Um, but it's it's 68% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, yeah. 62% audience score. Seems about right. Roger Ebert gave it two and a half stars. He, he liked it overall, and Leonard Malton just gives it two stars. Malton's like, All right. no. No hitch for me. I mean, that seems about what I would think. You yeah. know, it's not a amazing rom-com. It's not a terrible movie. It's just a, it's a, okay, it's an average movie, I think. Yeah. And, you know, Will Smith charisma kind of bumps it up a little bit in my thing actually i was gonna say this uh eva mendez actually i think doesn't really do much for me in this whole movie i really? think it, i think she could be replaced by another actress and it would have been a little better because she seems i know her character seems kind of standoffish but she doesn't seem to be having any fun in this movie and i think if you have someone that's i don't know i just this is kind of the way i read it i mean i, I liked her i thought yeah. she was good but I think if you have an actress that seems kind of like, you know, oh, I don't want to do this, but she kind of seems like maybe deep down inside there's this glimmer of her wanting to get out and live life would have been a little bit more. And I just didn't get that from Ava Mendes' character. Well, I was wondering what happened to Michael Rappaport because he's uh, only in like five minutes of the movie. And then Paula Patton is only in like 30 seconds of the movie. Yeah. But I, apparently this was her film debut. I didn't realize that. It was the first movie that she was in. Mike Rappaport, he was marrying Hitch's sister. Uh, he mentions that. I just thought he was going to show up more in the movie because yeah. he, he doesn't really ever. Ha- they play pool together and that's yeah. it. But he, that's, isn't that the classic Michael Rappaport? He's just there for like, I guess just so. like a little bit. And then I he, guess so. He had to get to a Knicks game after that. There he was go. probably at that same Knicks game with Kevin James and, and Spike Allegra. Lee. Yeah, and Spike Lee. Yeah, and yeah, Spike all, Lee all of them. yeah, he's probably sitting next to Spike Lee and they were talking about the moves they've done together and crying because the Knicks were doing well. I don't, I don't remember how the Knicks <laughs> were doing in 2005. I think they were doing better than they are now, but. Don't All right, Knicks fans. everything Knicks and more. <laughs> uh, so the pair with this movie, we wanted to do another rom-com. And for this, I actually leaned on Kirby a little bit to help uh, choose the next kind of movie. And the things we kind of keyed in on this is that, you know, Hitch is enabling and helping people change so they can, you know, find love. So we wanted to do another movie where someone goes through some changes and potentially finds love. And if you're thinking the 1950s Billy Wilder Sabrina, you're close, but you're not right. Because we're going to do, was it 1995's yeah. Sabrina starring, directed by Sidney Pollock and starring Harrison Ford. So that's what we're going to watch next, guys, the pair with this romantic comedy hitch. All right. So if... Y- so if you've seen Hitch and you feel any different, shoot us an email. If you're watching us on YouTube, leave a comment below and let us know. We answer viewers' questions on our second, our following episodes, our Wednesday episodes. So shoot us an email if you want a question answer on air. Follow us on social media. We're on Instagram, Real Shame, at Real Shame. And stay tuned next time as we dive into Sabrina and cross another movie off our movie list of shame. Thank you guys.